Um, but, you know, one of the things that really strikes me about your presentation and some of the words that really resonated with me were words like flexibility, context, autonomy, that is local sort of need and decision making, not just money, um, were all crucial. And um, at the same time, some of the things that have tried else, you know, at, at other places have been things like uh, charter schools, school takeovers, the I zones that we saw in Nashville, and of course, closing uh, some of these schools. Um, what most of the strategies we've looked at have not been able to do is address the rural cha challenges. And of course, you have a lot of experience with that in Kentucky. Um, in particular, <clears throat> with the rural challenges, when you start uh, pulling schools out of school districts and pulling resources out of districts, um, the rural counties have a lot more of a challenge to reabsorb those, those loss of resources. So I guess my, my question that I'd like to ask um, is, what do you think we ought to do about sort of the rural challenges, especially in some of the schools that have historically, and we can probably go back in those 20 years and look at some of those schools, even with the improvement, how do we support those schools and turn those around? I promise you this is not a setup. <clears throat> Oops. <laughs> but at the back of the PowerPoint, and it doesn't come up here, when you get the PowerPoint online, I'm looking for Joe, there is actually a video you can watch about Jones County, one of our most rural North Carolina counties, that did a fabulous turnaround. And you're going to hear from Pascal Mabinga, who was principal there during part of that and how Jones County did it with the resources Jones County had. And I would say their primary strategy was the development of their human capital. They simply developed who they had there and made a major transformation. So I think the answer to that question could be better seen by taking the time to watch that video. It's about 10 minutes. And it is linked. It's, it's the last slide on this PowerPoint from Joe Post. I knew you'd have a, a, a vision of that. That's awesome. Um, the other thing that I, I loved your chain, uh, and you know that the chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and and what that chain looks like. But there are also some stressors on that chain, and um, two of the stressors that are maybe a little beyond the purview of this committee, but I think are very relevant, are curriculum and testing. And um, do you have thoughts on, on those? I can tell you from my experience as a turnaround principal. In Kentucky, we had a test. And of course, when I said Deer Park, I mean, Masonville was at 42% proficient, and then it was at 95% proficient. That was as measured by the Kentucky test. And most states have those assessments and change those assessments. So sometimes it's like shooting for a target that's constantly moving, especially when the tests are modified every year. Luckily in Kentucky, when I was there, they were stable. North Carolina's been doing a lot of change and a lot of modification. I think that's in the state responsibility to get that assessment system set up and keep it stable. I think it's also really important that the state not manipulate their assessment system. I've looked at assessment across the country. In some states, every year they change the scale. So there's always going to be somebody at the bottom because they just put it on a scale in such a way there's always a percentage of the bottom. The states that have made it more of a power test, I think give a more accurate set of feedback to schools and districts about what kids are learning and what kids I, I hope that the one thing bad about being moderators, I can't write notes. So, Joe, I hope someone wrote those down because I think that also speaks to the challenge of teacher retention and how difficult it is as a classroom teacher to constantly be shifting uh, your curriculum. Bruce Miltworth with the School Boards Association. Uh, you talked about the importance of defining 
low performing schools. It's been an issue, a subject that has long been debated. It's controversial to say the least. But your three characters that you showed at the beginning got me thinking. Especially, I think it was the gray, no, uh, the second one, where if they do, if they start behind and never exceed growth, they'll never get back in line. They'll always be behind. So I wanted to get your thoughts on the current definition that says if you are a D or an F and only meet growth, you're a low performing school. Well, I know a lot about low performing schools. I think there needs to be a shared discussion of what would be the best definition because it's really complicated. School, the people you represent, school boards, absolutely hate to have one of their schools identified as low performing because of the message it sends to the community. Superintendents like John absolutely hate if a school in their district becomes identified as low performing because of the letters he has to send home and the kinds of things he has to do to make people aware that a school is low performing. And many parents who get those letters um, don't feel their school is low performing. So there's that side of the coin about how hurtful it is to be identified, but there's the other side of the coin that says how long can we let schools stay lagging consistently behind, what about those children? And I really think there has to be the, a group decision about what the best way is to handle that. I think right now our definition is set by the legislature. I always hope that the legislature will consistently try to refine their practice and learn and grow what they do as they set rules for the state. I guess if I personally could write it, I would write a different definition, a one that does not take in almost 25% of the schools in North Carolina, because I don't personally believe that 25% of our schools are low performing, so low that they need an intense intervention. Do I think those schools that are identified in that bottom quarter need to improve? Yes, I do. 